Hey everyone. So this week's videos are going to be a little bit different because we're actually covering one of the appendices in the textbook, not an actual chapter. So this is Appendix C, uh, where we cover how to uh, find and fix some of the different errors that you might come across in your programming. This video in particular is going to cover syntax errors. Uh, we're covering in the textbook, we're covering C.1, which is the section on syntax errors and the error list window. So all programming languages have rules about what makes for a valid programming statement and what doesn't. These rules are known as syntax. They govern how statements can be constructed. Um, which is really important because statements need to be constructed in a very specific way so that we can successfully translate them from sort of the more human speak that we're typing when we're actually coding and the binary speak that the computer can understand so that it can run the instructions. If we don't type out all of our statements very precisely, then that translation can't actually happen because the programs that we use to do that translation are to some extent pretty dumb and they can't really figure out what we're trying to say unless we say it in a very particular way. So that's why it's really important to have this very strong syntax that we have to follow when we're programming. So this is going to govern things like how we use parentheses and keywords and operators the placement of classes and procedures, all the different structures that we see within our code, the way that we define variables and procedures so that they can be used. It even governs things like how we insert the line breaks into our code, whether or not we need to use a line continuation character, because it automatically assumes that each line is its own line of code, so it has to have rules to figure out the exceptions when it's actually considered the same line of code as the previous line, you know, the previous fragment of a statement. A syntax error is when one of these rules is broken. This could include typos, when you mistype one of your variable names or you mistype a keyword, like if you misspelled the word integer, for example. Or if you write statements incorrectly, you uh, don't include certain keywords like dim in front of a variable um, construction or declaration statement, or you don't include the word and if at the end of an if statement, things like that. Um, mismatched parentheses, uh, using operators wrong in terms of like, for example, having an arithmetic operator with nothing on the left side, only numbers on the right side, right? That would be an incorrect use of an operator. Anything like that, any of those, uh, you know, anytime we break a rule of how to use Visual Basic, how to actually make a Visual Basic program, that is a syntax error. Now, Visual Basic programs cannot actually run if there are syntax errors, specifically because the compiler, the program that does the translation from Visual Basic to actual computer instructions, cannot understand instructions with syntax errors, which means that if it can't understand the instruction, then it doesn't know how to actually convert it to a binary computer instruction. So it can't successfully tell the computer what to do. So therefore, it can't make the program, which means that we are not allowed to run it. But the nice thing about syntax errors is that we are able to detect them ahead of time. We can actually detect them before we even try to run the program. And we can see that there are errors there and we can fix them before trying to run anything. So that's super helpful. So when Visual Studio notices that you have an error in your Visual Basic code, it will create a squiggle underneath that error. Uh, and it has two types of squiggles. There are red squiggles. Uh, by default, they're red and green. So the red ones are syntax errors. The program cannot actually run while you have syntax errors in your code. Um, so those are the ones that you have to fix before you actually are able to successfully run your program. And then the green squiggles are a warning, which 
aren't necessarily an error, but they might be able to cause problems. Um, and Visual Studio uh, can't actually, when it comes to these warnings, it can't actually tell whether or not those warnings are an error or if they are intentional. But based on what uh, the people who created Visual Studio were able to tell about how people tend to use certain things like variables or functions or sub procedures or whatever, um, they're able to guess with reasonable confidence that something might be wrong here, which then would prompt them to put a warning squiggle underneath that area. And we'll show, we'll see examples of both in just a second. So what we have is an application that takes in uh, the amount of sales that uh, each of the four salespeople for this company have actually made. And then it adds those numbers up and gives the total value in this label right here once the user presses calculate. So that is the application that we're working with right here. Now here's the code for button calc underscore click. Um, what it's doing is it's getting all of the uh, values from the text boxes uh, as integers, putting them into the uh, four variables defined for all of the salespeople up there, and then uh, adding all of them up, sticking them in this total variable here, and displaying it in the label. Now you can see the squiggles already. And we will uh, show off the squiggles, but what I want to do first is show off another feature. Uh, let's say I try to start and test the application right now. So I hit start. And you'll see that there are build errors. And it will ask me if I would like to continue and run the last successful build. When you see something like this, you should probably hit no. Because you don't want to run the last successful build and then assume that that's what the current build is doing because the last successful one um, does not reflect the changes that you were trying to make in order to make the current version. So usually, probably almost always you'll want to hit no, unless you have a good reason to hit yes. But I'll, I'll hit no right now. We'll see a few things. Um, up here, we'll see that there are three errors and one warning in this toolbar. We'll also see in this error list, which is right by the output window here, um, that there is a list of errors that are all, um, these three errors up here actually do correspond with the um, errors here. For example, if I hold my mouse over here, you may not be able to see it because the text is really small, but it gives some uh, error code which is a classification for all types of, you know, all of the errors of this particular type, and you can click it to learn more about that error if you so choose. But right here next to that, what it says is type, quote unquote, integer is not defined. Uh, type I-N-T-G-E-R. And down here too, it says this type is not defined. So for this particular error, um, it's not necessarily assuming that you've misspelled integer. We have misspelled integer. This should be spelled with an E, but it's not trying to assume that. It might assume that you are going to define the type integer uh, soon, but it doesn't want to assume that you misspelled anything, but it also doesn't want to assume that you need to define the type integer before using it so it doesn't give you that kind of message as well it just says that integer is not a def is not a defined type and then lets you figure it out for yourself in this case we know that we were trying to define it as an integer um after all this is int total with the integer id so what else would we expect so obviously we need to fix this by uh pressing the letter E right there to turn it into integer. So that is 
how you would fix a syntax error like this is you actually just take what is being, um, you know, you, you take what is being uh, flagged as a syntax error and you either fix the spelling or you fix the, um, whatever the statement is, you fix your use of operators, anything like that. And, you know, what I've just done right here is I undid that change because I want to show off something else real quick. But yeah, that's the essence of fixing syntax errors. You hunt down these uh, squiggles and you look for the message. And once you see the message, you then use that information to try to figure it out. Uh, there's also this show potential fixes right here. You can click that. Uh, that gives you a whole bunch of stuff that you aren't going to use, such as, for example, generate a new class called integer, generating a new type, all that kind of stuff. We're not going to worry about any of that, but it also gives you the example of, or sorry, the option to change integer to integer or to this other stuff that we haven't talked about. But in this case, using integer is the right move. Uh, I would not recommend choosing any of the options that aren't things that we have talked about yet because you might get yourself into a lot of trouble. So don't worry so much about that. Maybe avoid some of the possible fixes. But if you are lost, it might be a good thing to look at and say, uh, I see whether or not any of those fixes work for you, or if you don't want to do any of them and do something else, or even if you just want to ask me about it, I'm always open to helping. All right, so let's look at some more examples. Um, Right here, we have a parenthesis expected on line 23. Well, on line 23, uh, we have this squiggle right here. We can see that there's a left parenthesis for try parse, as you should have, but there's no right parenthesis. So you can fix this by uh, sticking a right parenthesis right there, and that gets rid of that error. Uh, that's going to be an important type of error to pay attention attention to, especially as you get into more complicated programs with lots and lots and lots of nested function calls inside of each other and parentheses within parentheses within parentheses and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's a kind of skill to be able to keep track of how many closing parentheses you need within a very complicated set of parentheses based statements. Um, but you'll probably see missing parentheses quite a bit. Uh, we also have this one right here, in total is not declared. Uh, like what I talked about before, Visual Basic doesn't necessarily want to assume that you misspelled int total, even though in total looks a lot like int total. Um, and it it's not going to necessarily assume that. It will uh, give you the recommendation if you show the potential fixes, uh, change in total to int total like that. It, it will give you the recommendation to change it to int total, but it also doesn't want to assume that you aren't also using some variable called in total. So it will just say it's not declared. And then it also will say it might be inaccessible due to its protection level. That's, that is Visual Basic saying, hey, you know, if you have actually another procedure where you had a local variable called in total defined, um, you can't use it in this one because it was defined in another procedure. So make sure you look out for that and make sure you actually define what in total is. That's it giving you a hint just in case that is your problem, but that's not the problem here. In this case, it's just a misspelling and we can fix it like that. All right, now what you might have caught if you were paying attention um, to this particular area of the screen is when I fixed this error right here, this int total warning went away. And when I fixed this error, oh, this error right here, the int total warning also went away. So what I wanna do is I wanna check out what this int total warning actually is. It says variable int total is used before it has been assigned a value. A null reference exception could result at runtime. What that means 
is that um, right here, because we've misspelled integer, this isn't recognized as a valid type. And because this isn't recognized as a valid type, when Visual Studio is checking through the code to make sure all the syntax is good, it then doesn't assume that int total would have the default value of zero as it would if we had said that it was an integer. Right now, Visual Studio assumes that int total has the default value zero as it's checking through to make sure everything is correct. And then down here, it will say, okay, well, we know that int total will at least have the value zero, if not something else. So that's okay to have. But, you know, if we don't do that, then Visual Studio can't actually assume that int total will have a value right here because it's, it's not set to a valid type. So then it doesn't have a default value that it would if it was associated, sorry, that it would if it had the associated default value of zero for integer. No, right now, because it's not an integer, it's something that doesn't actually exist. It doesn't have that default value of zero. It just is an, a variable with an empty storage container with nothing in it. It's a, the, the, and the storage container doesn't even have a proper size because that size hasn't been, you know, declared yet since we don't know what the type of this variable is. Now, the reason why fixing this gets rid of that warning is because we have down here a statement where int total is set equal to something. And in this case, Visual Basic actually knows that these are all integers, which means that this must be an integer as well. So at the very least, it will have zero because at the very least, all of these will have zero. So because int total must have a guaranteed value, even though it doesn't have a valid type, it must have some guaranteed value, either zero or some other integer. This warning also goes away because of that um, set value. So that's why both of those errors actually fixes this warning. What happens if um, it is used before it is assigned a value it talks about a null reference exception right here. And essentially that is when a variable is not actually truly given a storage locker. When it's assigned a type at declaration, it's given a storage locker with enough space for data of that type. And the reason why it does that is because, you know, Visual Basic wants to wait until it knows for sure what the type of that variable is so that it can save as much memory space as possible. If that variable ends up holding an integer, but Visual Basic just gave it a double just in case it needed to have a double in it, that would be bad because it's wasting memory. Or if it gave it a double because maybe it needs to be a double, but then I try to put a really, really, really long string in it, then it might not have enough memory. And it would uh, cut, it, it would lose a lot of data from that string because you can't fit the entire string inside of that small-ish double space. So instead of doing any of that, instead of risking memory like that, it just doesn't assign a storage locker at all. And then if we try to use a variable before it has been assigned a storage locker, we get this null reference exception, which essentially means that the variable doesn't refer to a valid storage locker, a valid memory location. It refers to a null location, which just doesn't exist. Null means that the memory location just doesn't exist at all. But of course, we fix it by either saying that int total is an integer, which means that int total is automatically assigned that storage locker. Or, I mean, really it's and in this case, because we have to fix both of these. Um, we also have to set int total, you know, not set, I apologize. We have to fix int total right here, which means that we are for sure setting it equal to some value. Also, I do want to point out that it is a syntax error to use a variable that has not been defined, specifically because the syntax requires variables to be defined before they are actually used as a calculation or set, setting them equal to something. They have to be 
declared before we can do that. Same with actual procedures. Um, you have to declare the procedures at some point in the class. It doesn't matter if they're declared above or below. They just have to be declared at some point uh, in order for you to actually call those procedures. So now really quickly, what I want to do is actually show off what happens when you have that null reference thing. And then I am getting a little bit ahead of myself because we'll be talking more about this type of error in a future video for this appendix. But I just want to show it since we're talking about it right now. So um, what I can do is turn off these option statements. These option statements are actually preventing us from having this type of error. So you should actually you know, use these option statements. They are only helping you. It might make it seem like you have to jump through all these hoops with regards to types and making sure that uh, you're declaring the variables right and that uh, the, the uh, you know, type conversion stuff is all good and all that, but they're really helping you for things like this. I comment these out right here. And then I don't declare int total as an integer. And then I also don't set int total equal to anything. What I talked about before was that we say int total is some variable, but we don't actually give it a way to have a value, which means that it never gets a memory locker. And right here, again, we get the warning. It's being used before it has been assigned a value. A null reference exception could result at runtime. Visual Basic can't actually predict that for sure, but it sees the warning signs that maybe this might happen, and in this case, it's going to be correct. Here's what's that, what that looks like. I run the application, and it doesn't even matter if I put anything in here because I'm not actually using uh, these int Jack, int Mary, int Khalid, int uh, Sharon variables. I could just hit the calculate button, and we get a null reference uh, exception because an object reference is not set to an instance of an object. In other words, int total is not actually set to anything. It's not set to an integer or even a double or a decimal for that matter. It's not set to anything. It's just a variable that doesn't have a memory location. And it's very, very sad about that. So that's why that warning is really important, which is why, you know, we are able to prevent that from happening by uh oh, not the debugger you can prevent that by from happening by uh putting these option statements in and then as you can see here we get a new area sorry a new error that says object strict on requires all variable declarations to have an as clause we have to declare the type of every variable, which means that every variable will have that default value for that type, which means that it's impossible for us, at least in this case right here, the way we're working with it, to get a null reference exception. And that just completely fixes it. All right, so I have one more procedure that I want to show off. It's just some little thing that I put at the bottom of this program as a quick example. Um, I just want to show off some other syntax errors. So for example, um, I can do for the procedure definition, the procedure header, uh, let's say I put as in between private and sub. Uh, you'll see a whole lot of bad things happening. Um, the as keyword is not valid as an identifier. What Visual Basic thinks is happening is I'm trying to make a procedure called as, but as is a keyword because we use that to define types. So I'm not allowed to use that. Um, you have all this weird stuff that kind of happens because of that, like statement cannot appear outside of a method body or declaration expected or any of that. Most of this is just going to be complete nonsense because this one right here completely destroys uh, Visual Basic's idea of what is going on with this procedure. So oftentimes what you want to do is fix the topmost syntax error in a procedure and then go top down and see like what changes. If you just look at this and you saw eight syntax errors and you tried to work from the bottom, 
End sub must be preceded by a matching sub. Well, there's a sub up here, so what's going on? Like, you run into all those really confusing issues. But if you self start at the top and just fix the as right there, then everything is fixed. So one syntax error can actually cause multiple syntax errors because of how Visual Studio tries to, you know, check to make sure that everything is valid. Uh, when it sees that this procedure header is not valid, then it doesn't consider this whole thing as an attempt at making a procedure. It just says, this is an invalid statement. Let's go into the next line and treat it as if it's its own thing. Hey, why is this uh, label total thing outside of a method? Why is this for uh, loop outside of a method? All that kind of stuff. Um, I can even do this right here, private as test. Something similar happens, but well, yeah, actually, same thing happens. Um, keyword is not valid as an identifier sub. And then if I do as instead of test, again, keyword is not valid as an identifier, but this time it's recognizing that this is a procedure header because private and sub are both present and they are right next to each other. When it sees private sub, it recognizes, okay, this is a procedure. It sees that I'm trying to name it as, which shows Visual Basic that I am indeed trying to make the procedure. So there we go. Get that back down here, test. Um, also, I did make a mistake right here as I was writing this code uh, with the expression expected and all that. Uh, I used single quotes for the string instead of double quotes. So that's my bad there. That's another syntax error that happened. Uh, another one we could look at is if I get rid of this and if, then the if statement will have an if must end with a matching end if error. Similarly, if I get rid of the if statement itself, and if must be preceded by a matching if, which is up here. Uh, this can be particularly uh, troublesome to keep track of if you have nested loops, although Visual Studio does kind of autofill these if statements and repetition structures and stuff for you, so that's pretty nice. Um, we can also look at getting rid of as integer right here. You'll see that int n is not declared. It may be inaccessible due to its protection level but it's not inaccessible. It wasn't declared in any of these other procedures, so it's just that it is not declared. And then you get the same issue with all other uses of int n. So remember that with a for loop, we either have to declare it above the for loop or in the for loop. So as integer, like so. So in summary, be sure to carefully look for syntax errors in your code as you work. Um, especially because of how syntax errors can create others, like what might look to be like syntax errors below them, but aren't actually. Like what happened when I messed up that procedure header and then everything inside the procedure looked really bad. So if you get stuck in the weeds trying to fix everything in the procedure, you might miss the fact that the procedure header itself is off and you need to fix that first. So look carefully for the syntax errors and fix the first one in the procedure before anything else. Uh, syntax errors prevent code from being built specifically because the compiler cannot translate them into valid instructions for the computer if it doesn't recognize them as valid syntax, so you have to fix them. And warnings are possible future problems that you also should try to address. They might not be as cut and dry as fixing a syntax error, but you really should evaluate them and make sure that either you can fix them or be absolutely positive that you don't need to before moving on. So that's syntax errors, the first of the types of errors that we'll be covering in this appendix.